With your Bibles and your study guides ready, available this morning, we'll continue our mini-sermon series on the subject of the unfolding drama of redemption. And for the next few weeks, we're going to look at what the majority of prophecy watchers, not all of them, but the majority, believe to be the next event on God's prophetic calendar, and that is the rapture of the church. Now, the Bible says the rapture of the church could occur at any moment. And because there are no specific signs leading up to that event, uh, it could happen even before I finish the sermon today. Jesus said when God the Father gives him the word, he will step out on the front porch of heaven and he will shout for all of his followers, come up here, come up hither. I love the King James language there. Revelation 4.1. And Paul said in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the bodies of all believers, both living or dead, will be changed from physical to spiritual, from mortal to immortal, and be caught up, caught up, caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So, beloved, the rapture of the church is imminent, which means it could happen at any moment. There's no warning. Uh, there's no a sign saying this is it. No, it is going to happen. And we're going to explain that today in the sermon. Now there are those who do not believe in the rapture of the church. Hard to believe, but there are those who don't believe it's going to happen. Then there are those who believe in the rapture of the church, but they don't believe it's going to happen prior to the tribulation. They're quick to point out that the English word rapture does not appear in the Bible, and guess what? They're correct. However, the word rapture comes from Paul's words in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 through 18, when he said, The dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Now, I know I've got a couple of Greek students here, so they're going to test me this morning. The words caught up were translated from the Greek word harpazo, which means to carry off or to snatch up, or as our hundred years ago they might say to fetch away. We don't use the word fetch much anymore. It is still used in, uh, in the UK a lot, but to fetch away. So to translate the Greek harpazo to the English word rapture takes two steps. Number one, harpazo became the Latin word, the Latin word for raptus. And then the raptus became the English word for rapture. So you have that in the translation. You have to go through that process. Beloved, here's my desire. My desire is to prepare you to live every moment of every day uh, in the expectation of being fetched away. And you need to live that. Remember this. The next word you say could be your last word. It reminded me when I got to this point in my sermon many, many years ago in another church, I got a call. I was an associate pastor at the time, and there had been a major, major accident on one of the major highways. And as I got out there, here was this man just bellowing and bellowing and bellowing. And I said, what's going on? He said, that's my wife in that car. And so we went on for a long time, and she, of course she had, been, she had been immediately killed. And he, I just could not console the man. And so when I got back to his house and with him a little while, I said, why are you so unconsolable? He said, Pastor Wayne, it's not the fact that she's dead. But the fact is we had the horrible, the most horrible quarrel this morning, and I called her a name. And she went out into eternity thinking that's what I thought of her. Beloved, the last, the next word you speak could be the last word you speak. Make it count. Now the truth is Jesus Christ will return to this earth as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. At this, but it's not, that truth is not as prevalent today as it should be. You know why? Because it's not been proclaimed by many who claim to be pastors and preachers as it should be. They just don't want to talk about it. They, talk, well, they want to talk about it today and here and now. Weather forecasters can tell us that there's a storm approaching and well, we go into a panic mode and uh, so that we make sure what the, we have enough to get through. Three, fl three flakes of snow fall in Perry, and everybody goes into a panic. <laughs> Pastors warn of the nearness of God's return, the nearness of Christ's return, ushering in the final events of this age, for heaven's sake. I mean, the final events of this age is going to be ushered in by the call. 
And even the majority of Christians sort of brush it off. Oh, oh, you've preached about this. I remember when you preached about this 10 years ago, preacher. It's not going to happen. It's, it hasn't happened yet. The Bible says, oh, this scoff at it. Oh, we've heard all this before. It's not going to happen. 79% of Christians say they believe Jesus will return someday. But only 20% believe He will return in their lifetime. Which means they do not believe the rapture of the church is imminent. They do not live in that expectation of hearing that call. The, the case sera, that kind of case sera, sera attitude, listen to me, has no place in the Christian's life. It is incompatible with the biblical characteristics of a true follower of Christ. The return of Christ to this earth is a cardinal truth of Christianity, which means we can't continue to treat this major doctrine uh, with such indifference. It's just not right. Since human history is moving toward that appointed day, and all the evidence of that truth is manifested before us today in so many ways, I believe the soon rapture and the return of Christ is the message that God's people need to hear today, which is why I stopped the exposition of the epistles of Peter in order to deal with this. Everything we believe about the Christian faith is consummated in Christ's return to this earth. Judging the ungodly and believing, and then re removing the curse of sin. It's the only way we're going to get rid of evil is with Christ to turn, return and set His feet up there, there upon the Mount of Olives. He's going to set up His kingdom there on this earth for a thousand years, including the new temple. And then He will establish the new heaven and the new earth where we will dwell with Him forever. It's a 1,500 mile cube that hangs over this present earth for all of eternity. Beloved, without the Lord's return, there's no point to His birth. There's no point to His death. There's no point to His burial or resurrection. Christianity becomes nothing more than just another humanistic religion. Unless there is an end to the story, which we know the end of the story, unless there's some end to it, then this is just an exercise in the futility of another dead-end humanistic religion. Christians should not be among those today who are wringing their hands regarding what's going on today, worrying about what's going to happen in the future. That should not characterize us as Christians. Why? Because the final chapter has already been written, and it's already been revealed to us in the pages of Scripture. And you and the Holy Spirit can figure that out. We can and we should know what's coming. We can and we should know where we are on God's prophetic calendar. We know that it's Sunday. We know that it's August. We know a lot of things about it. We know how many days it is to Christmas. We ought to know where we are on God's prophetic calendar. God is sovereign, of course. But there's a great difference between trusting in God's sovereignty and a case or a attitude. Whatever it will be, will be. So in a few weeks, God willing, we will be looking at the crowns we as Christians will receive when we stand before the Lord on the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Timothy 4.8, the Apostle Paul told his disciple, There was a crown of righteousness laid up for him, which is the Lord. The righteous judge will give him on that day. And, and watch this. But he said, Not to him only. But to all, all who love the Lord's appearing. Long for and love the Lord's appearing. Can't wait to see Him. You wake up every morning, Lord, could this be the day? Could this be the day? We need to live every day in that blessed hope of being snatched away. So, over the next few weeks, we're going to dig a little bit deeper into the chronology of eschatology. Don't let that scare you. It's just a study of the prophetic events of the last days of this age and on into the future. And since we're witnessing the conversion of all these prophetic events leading up to the arrival of the Antichrist, whom I believe is just waiting in the shadows right now, the start of the New World Order, which they will not give up regardless of who's elected this fall, the beginning of the Tribulation, and we can see the nations gathering around Israel today. I want to take the time to help you understand why, not only where we are, but why we are where we are. And hopefully accomplish what the Apostle Paul said, the knowledge of all this should do, and that is to bring you comfort, comfort, comfort. Again, sermons like this are not meant to scare you, but they're meant to prepare you about uh, what the Bible says is about to happen. Uh, you know, let me close out this introduction with this. Perfected love, cast out all fear. If you and your spouse know that you love each other, there's nobody else in the world you'd rather be with, perfected love casts out all fear of ever being unfaithful. And when that love is perfected between you and the Lord, you have no fear of what's going to happen. Because if you're here, the Lord's with you. If you're there, you're with Him. 
You can't lose. Now, with that backdrop, I want you to turn to a very familiar passage, John chapter 14. John chapter 14, to be finding verse 1 through 3, because I want you to have your Bibles open and listen to this very carefully. The Lord gave us a promise of a reunion. He gave it to His disciples in the upper room, but the promise is to us. John 14, 1 through 3. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me and my Father's house, or many rooms. Do not kind of go with the gospel song mentions there. It doesn't translate that well. If you were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you. Underscore the word, block in the word, receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Now, this conversation began back in chapter 13, I believe it is, ends in chapter 16. We're not going to cover all of that. But they had been in this upper room so many times before, but this time they knew something was different because they knew this time Jesus was in fact going to leave them. The hour of His departure had arrived. In fact, they were going through the first stages of grief because they were trying to figure out what life was going to be like without Him. You've been through that. Some of you have when you lost your loved one. You realize how in the world can we go on without that person in my life? That's exactly what they're, that's the first stage of grief. And they were doing that with Jesus. Down at verse 15 and following, Jesus assured them, He said, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm going to pray the Father to send the Holy Spirit to be your helper. And the helper there means to paraclete, somebody who would come alongside and who would be with them forever. And by the way, that's exactly what happens when we receive Christ as our Savior. The Holy Spirit comes in as our paraclete, comes alongside of us. He takes up residence in our lives and He dwells within us, giving us the Spirit of Christ, giving us the power of Christ so that we can go into the world and manifest the image of Christ to the unbelieving world. It's an amazing time sometime, I, I don't, don't want to say this out of school, but people walk up to me and they will say something about uh, uh, a Christian and so forth. You wonder, is there a name tag? Is there on my t-shirt? No, that's the Holy Spirit manifesting the, the image of Christ through you and you're not, not even aware of it. That's what it means, by the way, to be a Christian. christ young, Christ in me, giving everybody the hope of glory. But even as comforting as that was to these men, the disciples were still grief-stricken that Jesus was not going to be with them anymore. So if you look back in verse 1 through 3, Jesus made a promise that He would return and receive them unto Himself, that where He was going, they would also be. To complete the redemptive purpose for which He'd come, Jesus had to go back to the Father and then return for us. Now, just as expected parents um, prepare a room for their baby, and just as a hostess prepares a room for her guest, to fulfill His love for us, Forty days after He finished the work the Father sent Him to do, Jesus ascended back to heaven and has been there for 2,000 years preparing a place for the redeemed, the redeemed, the purchase of redeemed, those He redeemed by the purchase of His blood. Can you imagine what that place is going to look like? Among other trades, my, my wife's father, my father-in-law was an accomplished carpenter. He could build houses from scratch and barns and buildings and bridges and whatever. He, uh, he knew the difference between a heavyweight hammer that was used on the outside, a lighter weight hammer that was used from the inside. And then he always told me, he said, Wayne, I love to reach down to my toolbox and pull out that little finishing hammer because I know I'm about done with that house. Beloved, I believe the Lord has got a little finishing hammer and He's putting on the crown mold of our room in glory right now. And, he, and when God the Father is, uh, puts His stamp of approval upon the place where we will dwell with Him, <laughs> He will tell His Son, go get your bride, and He will descend from heaven. He will descend, not return. He will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God, and He will gather all the believers unto Himself and receive us into the Father's house where we will be with Him forever. Now, let me just say this. This is not wishful thinking. This is not some religious fantasy. This is not some pie in the sky and the sweet by and by. No, 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 no. This is an essential doctrine to the Christian faith. 
It defines the purpose of God's plan for our redemption to deliver us from evil, to deliver us from darkness into his light and from evil into holiness and to be in his presence forever. That is the culmination of the whole plan of redemption for heaven's sake. Do you love that? Do you understand that? Do you, have, do, can you camp out on that passage in John 14? James Battery was the author of Peter Pan, among many other works, including a book about his mother, Margaret Ogilvy. Growing up in Scotland, his mother endured a lot of heartaches and frustrations and misery, including the death of one of her sons. According to Barry, John 14 was his mother's favorite chapter. In fact, she read it so many times, every time she would sit down to read the Bible, it would just pop open to John 14. Barry said when his mother became so old, her eyes could no longer read the words. Many mornings he would see his mother bend down and kiss the page on her Bible where Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you, and I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also. Let me ask you, do you have such a longing for that? Do you have such a, just an assurance of that promise? Number two, if you will take your Bibles and turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 through 18. Here's the main thrust of our text today. Beloved, he said, I don't want you to be pregnant. I don't want you to be ignorant here, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. I'll explain this later, but just underscore these words, fallen asleep. Lest you sorrow as those who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Underscore the word with him. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord will not by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. Now, the Thessalonians knew about the return of Christ. And like all other first century believers, they in fact thought the return of Christ would be in their day. Paul even thought that at many times. They looked forward to living in the new kingdom of heaven. Unlike us, they looked forward to that. We kind of like it down here, even though there's some things about it we don't like. But we kind of hope he delays his coming until, well, until it, this gets worse. Let me give you a couple of examples of their longing for that new kingdom. Turn back there to chapter, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 3. Paul praised these Christians for a look at that. Their work of faith, your labor of love, your steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the presence of God the Father. They were hoping to see Christ and to be reunited with Him. They lived in that blessed hope. Look at verse 9. Paul praised them saying, You turn to God from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead that is jesus now underscore this next line who rescues us from the wrath to come they were waiting for christ's return they were like the disciples in the upper room they wanted to know when jesus would return to the earth and establish his glorious kingdom let me ask you do you live in that expectation is that the heartbeat of your heartbeat every morning when you rise up? Lord, let this be the day. Maranatha, Maranatha, Maranatha. So Paul put on his pastoral hat and he began his class in eschatology here. So follow along with me in verse 13. First of all, he said, I don't want you to be ignorant. Well, I can remember my professor saying that too. I don't want you to be ignorant concerning those who fall asleep, lest you sorrow as those who have no hope. Over the years, I've conducted funerals for families whose loved ones have died and didn't have the assurance of their salvation, no evidence. Maybe they joined the church or were baptized, or maybe they never darkened the door of a church. And there was no physical evidence that they'd ever received Christ as their Savior. Not much a pastor can do at that moment, is there? I mean, I can't preach them out of hell. So I'd ask the family members, do you, do you know anything about, do you know, is it written down in the Bible somewhere, the date they may have made their confession of faith? Do, do you know for sure? And the best answer they could come up with is what? We hope so. Folks, that's not time to have a hope so salvation. 
So they'd reach back in the museum of memories and begin to think about all the good things their loved one had done, but in their heart of hearts they knew all they were doing was covering up the reality that their lost one was in hell. They could do nothing about it, and neither could their loved one. Grandparents, parents, family members, sons and daughters, do me a favor. Assure your family of your eternal salvation. Free them up from that horrible grief from which there is no cure. Living every day of the rest of their life knowing that perhaps their loved one is in the fires of hell from which there are no escape. But here was the dilemma of the people there in Thessalonica, and it caused them much grief. They wanted to know, Paul, what about those believers who had died? What about those who would die before the Lord returned? Would they miss the gathering of the saints at the river? Would they miss the gathering of the saints in glory? Beloved, they loved one another so much they didn't want anybody to miss out on the rapture. They didn't want anybody to miss out on the glory of being a part of the kingdom of God. Secondly, they were suffering such severe persecution, they thought they were already in the midst of the tribulation, and they had missed the rapture. In fact, somebody had already written a letter and claimed to be the Apostle Paul and said, oh, you've missed it all. Christ has already come. It's already over. You missed it. Now understand this. These Christians were not expecting the Antichrist. These Christians were not expecting for the return of Christ to wipe out all of his enemies and to destroy their enemies. What they were waiting is, is for the Lord to come and deliver them from the wrath to come. To receive them unto himself, just as he had promised the disciples. And perhaps, by the way, some in the Thessalonica were among the 500 who saw the resurrected and the ascended Lord. Now I want to pick up one verse from what uh, Brett read this morning in 1 Corinthians. Because the truth is connected here. These two passages are so interconnected. It's um, 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Paul told the Corinthian Christians, Behold, I tell you a mystery. And he uses that word several times. Only Paul. Mystery here is to speak of a truth that had been hidden for some time, but that had been revealed to Paul through his encounter with Christ. And he was going to reveal that mystery here to the Christians at Thessalonica. He also revealed it to the Christians in Corinth. It was concerning those who died before the Lord returned to take us home to be with the Father's house. Not the return of Christ, but the return to take us home. First Paul referred to those who have died or will die before the rapture of the church as those who have fallen asleep. And he used the word sleep there to remind them, while the body dies, the soul never dies. The soul of man never dies. It lives forever somewhere. At death, the saved souls are ushered into the eternal presence of the Lord. Lost souls are ushered into hell to await the final resurrection, followed by the great white throne judgment, followed by being cast into the lake of fire forever. And by the way, let me just tell you as your pastor, any teaching other than that is contrary to Scripture as well. Now Paul lists three foundational truths here that affirm the rapture of the church of the Christians prior to the return of Christ. Mark them down in your Bible, verse 14. The first evidence is the death of Christ. If we believe that Jesus died, what does that mean? Beloved, our only hope of victory over death is the death of Jesus Christ. For His death paid the penalty for our sin. In bearing our sins on His body, Jesus gave us the victory over sin, over death, and the grave. So as long as we are alive, Christ lives in us. But if we die before the rapture, we are alive in Christ. We can't lose. For almost three or four years, I prayed that the Father would take my mother home. She was in the deep, darkest throes of dementia and Alzheimer's. And I said, Lord, I know the moment she closes her eyes here, she'll be more alive there than she ever was down here. Let it be today. Number two, look at number verse 14. If we believe Jesus rose again, but over the only hope of our victory over the grave is Christ's physical resurrection. Listen, if he couldn't conquer death himself, he, can't, he certainly can't conquer it for us. Now read the rest of verse 14. Even so, God will bring with him those who are asleep in Jesus. So look up here for a moment. I don't mean to be this dramatic. 
But the bodies of every, of every person is either interred somewhere or they're destroyed somewhere, but they're, they're here. They're, they're dead. They're dying or, or they're dead. But their souls, to be absent from the body, say the next line, to be absent from the body is to what? Be present with the Lord. Okay, so the souls of our departed loved one are with the Lord. Now let's suppose the rapture occurred today, and I'm alive, we're alive today, uh, our souls are here, right? And because Christ is within us. So what's going to happen? He's going to bring those souls with Him, and we will be joined together. I'll explain that momentarily. That's the first clue, by the way, to the mystery. When Jesus descends from heaven, He will snatch away all those who believed in Him, whether well, they, they are alive or whether they've been dead, dead for 2,000 years, and guess what? He's going to bring those souls down with Him. Number three, look at the divine revelation of the Lord. Now, this is important. Underscore in your Bible. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord. I didn't get this email. I didn't get this from somebody's book. Uh, I forgot who they want to give credit for the rapture for, but Darby. But I didn't get this from Mr. Darby. No, this is that I got this from the word of the Lord. Paul was not spiritualizing a truth to comfort the brethren, for goodness sake. Paul was drawing upon what Jesus had told the disciples in John 14, which had been revealed to Paul, by the way, by Christ himself. Verse 15, and this was the revelation. We who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord, the rapture, by, by no means will precede those who are asleep. So on the basis of Christ's death and resurrection, and the confirmation Paul had received from Christ, Paul assured these first Corinthians believers that those who died before the rapture had not missed a thing, nor would anybody else who died miss a thing, other than a lot of earthly troubles down here. Let me ask you, those of you who lost loved ones, who's better off today? Think about that. You see, their, their battle is over. <laughs> their victory is won. Ours still is still yet to come. We still have to put up with the vicissitudes of this world. You see, their physical bodies were interred, but their souls were alive to be absent of the body, present with the Lord. And those who die in Christ will come with Him on the day of the rapture, and we who are alive when He calls will go with Him to the Father's house, and we all are going to get to the front porch at the same time. Nobody's going to miss a thing. Then Paul revealed the pattern of events on that glorious day. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. In other words, the shout, the voice is going to sound like an angel voice. It's going to sound like a trumpet. The rapture is not going to be silent. It's not going to be secret. The shout, the voice, and the trumpet may be heard by the majority of the people, but the majority of the people won't understand what it is. That is, until they look around and the folks to whom they were talking are not there, or the folks to whom they were sleeping are not there, or the little children are gone. Some people believe that only those who are saved will hear the voice, and that may be true, but the effect's going to be the same. The absence of millions of people around the world are going to get their attention. The last trump signals the close of the church age. The church is gone. It's no more. And the head of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ, will descend from heaven, and He will shout, Come up hither. Come up here. Verse 16, And the dead in Christ will rise first. Spurgeon said, though the bones be scattered to the four winds of heaven, yet all at the call of the Lord they shall come together again, bone to bone, and be reunited with their souls. And the Apostle Paul explained that in detail in 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Notice he used the word mystery again. Behold, I show you a what? A mystery. We shall all not sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. At the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall all be changed. No matter their state of decomposition, no matter where they might be, whether their bodies are blown up to bits in a bomb, or doesn't make any difference. Our new imperishable body will be inhabited by our new glorified spirit, and for the first time in our lives, we can look in the mirror and say, I am perfect. It won't be until that day but it will be that day. Verse 53, this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal shall put on immortality. What does that mean? Well, we're going to have, we're going to have some kind of body, but it will not have the physical limitations of our present body because this body is flesh and blood and bone. And somehow or other there was not going to be flesh, blood, and bone in a spiritual body. 
1 John chapter 3, verse 2, the apostle wrote, Now we are the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know when He is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. So our bodies will be like the resurrected body of Christ. Remember he was speaking with the disciples one moment in the upper room and all of a sudden he was cooking breakfast for Peter and the disciples on the Sea of Galilee. He could move at the speed of thought. Can you imagine that? 1 Thessalonians 4.17 Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them, with them, with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Yes, it's dramatic. I understand that. Yes, it's hard to grasp that at some point in the future, all of a sudden, the bodies of believers will begin rising from their graves, wherever they are, and they will join the bodies of living believers from all over the world, and all of a sudden we're going to be drawn up into the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, who has descended, by the way, from heaven to meet us in the clouds and to take us to be at the Father's house. Now let me ask you a question, and I want you an honest answer. Don't answer out loud, but answer in your heart. Do you doubt the veracity of what the Apostle Paul said here? Beloved, either what Paul said here is the absolute truth, or nothing Paul said is the absolute truth. We must put this among the miracles of Christianity, including the Immaculate Conception, the Divine Substitution, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit within our human bodies. The fact that it is inconceivable in human terms only confirms its divine authenticity, and we must accept it by faith or be guilty of unbelief. And what's that sin that so easily besets us? Unbelief. And so somebody preaches about the rapture of the church. Oh, I don't believe that. I believe Jesus died, and I believe He rose again, and I believe He's coming again, but I don't believe in the rapture. Well, listen, that is unbelief. You want to face the Lord with that? Do you really want to face the Lord with that? Look at verse 17. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Now, first that implies that we're with the Lord today. <laughs> And second, it gives us hope to the dying, doesn't it? Because the moment that we live this life in death, that we start living the life forever. Third, being free from the presence of sin. I long for this day. Being free from the presence of sin for the first time, we will have an unsinful, blemished view of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We shall know Him as He knows us, and we shall rejoice in that oneness forever and forever and forever and then some. Verse 18, therefore comfort one another with these words. Notice Paul said they were to comfort one another. Not comfort themselves, but comfort one another. That's what we need to be doing right now. In all that's going on, we need to comfort each other. By the way, the only, the only way the snatching away makes a lick of sense if it, is, if it delivers us from the impending danger of judgment. How can we be comforted by Paul's words if we're going to have to um, endure even a portion of God's wrath during the tribulation? Oh, we're going to deliver half of it, then we're going to go, where do you get that? How is that being delivered from the wrath to come? I'm convinced that the pre-tribulation position of the rapture is the only one that's biblically correct. Let me give you three passages right here that will prove that, if you will. Just give me a few minutes here. First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. Paul said these believers had turned from their idols to serve the living and true God and wait for His Son from heaven. And wait for Him from heaven. Even Jesus who does, who delivers us from the wrath to come. They were expecting Christ's return. They weren't expecting Christ's return to come and finish the end of the age. No, they were expecting Christ to come and deliver them from the wrath to come. Paul believed Christians, if, if, um, if Paul believed Christians would go through the tribulation, would he not have told them, now look, uh, the rapture's going to come, but I'm going to tell you, you're going to have to go through the part of the tribulation before he gets there. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, 3 through 10. If Paul knew Christians were going to face the horror of the great tribulation, would he not have warned them about the greater trial? You think you're suffering trials now? Man, you better get prepared for the tribulation. The rapture of the church must precede the arrival of the Antichrist. I'll prove that next week to you. And at the time of the tribulation, I want to prove to that in a final point. And if you'll take out your study guide and look on the back, there is a guide there, a chart. We want to see the Lord's picture of our redemption. Let me give you a couple of verses here. Revelation 19.7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give Him glory 
For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. Throughout his epistles, the Apostle Paul portrayed the church as the bride of Christ. In Ephesians 5, 21 through 32, Paul even quoted the command God made, to Genesis, made in Genesis 2, 24, saying, for this reason, for what reason? For the reason of marital oneness, marital unity. A man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Now, Paul said, here is the definition of that great mystery. He says, I'm not speaking of the union of man and woman only. I'm speaking of the union of Christ and his church, the marriage of Christ and his church. So how does a first century Jewish wedding compare to the marriage Jesus and his bride, the church? Well, the chart on your study guide will be helpful here because not only are you seeing the parallels of a Jewish wedding in our relationship with Christ, but more importantly, you're seeing where we are on that pattern and therefore what is coming next. Now, first of all, notice that there are six steps in what the Jews call the betrothal. We might refer to it as the engagement period. So what happened during the first part of the betrothal? Well, the groom left his father's house, went to the future bride's home where he established the price for his bride with her father. It was paid and accepted. And that legally bound the couple as a husband and wife. And that moment, by the way, the wife was, the bride was declared to be sanctified, to be set apart for her husband. It was as if though they were legally married, but yet not living together. We have reversed that today, have we not? Then the groom returned to his father's house to prepare the place for them to live, which usually meant to add a room onto the father's house. I love this about that culture. It's not the American culture. I wish it would be more, but it's not. When, when they get married, there's still a patriarch-matriarch type of situation. And so the word oikos comes into play here. It means we just add a room for the next family. But it's all they just add a part to the family. The bride leaves her family and joins the husband's family, but they all become one. And they all gather around the same table. Can you imagine how many generations that would be in due time? 2,000 years ago, Jesus left his father's house to come to earth to make a marriage covenant with his bride. What happened? Jesus paid the price for our sins by his death on the cross. And in so doing, he offered salvation to all those who will receive it. And those who will become the bride of Christ. We're sanctified. We're set apart. We belong to Christ just as if we were already with Christ. He gave us the ring of the Holy Spirit, the down payment, the guarantee that he will and is coming back for us when the Father gives him the word. He said, I'm leaving the Holy Spirit to convince you that I will not leave you as orphan, but I'm praying that the Father is going to give you the Holy Spirit to convince you I will return. And the bride and the groom were separate, separated for a minimum of 12 months while he, the groom prepared their home. And the bride gathered her trousseau, the necessities, the pots and the pans and everything else to do the housemaking. This is where we are. Put it down on your, dot it on your calendar. This is where we are on God's prophetic calendar. As Jesus told the disciples, he's gone to prepare a place for us. And beloved, since it's been 2,000 years in the making, I, again, I ask you, can you imagine? Can you imagine what the house is looking like today? Now, notice the last six steps are in what the Jews call the wedding. And once they begin, here's where we get the word imminent. Once they begin, it becomes impossible to stop. They happen rapidly, imminently. When our, when our living quarters are ready, the father's going to send his son to get his bride. He's going to step out on the, on the porch of heaven and say, come forth. And beloved, we as a bride must be dressed and ready at all times because we know not when he's going to come. And when we, but we will run to meet him and then we will go to the father's house where we will enter the wedding chamber for seven days while the marriage union is consumed, phys uh, consummated physically. And then there will be a great wedding feast to celebrate the start of a new family. And that feast can last for days. You remember, one of the first things Jesus attended was what? A wedding feast. And they ran out of the wine. And Jesus made turn the water and the wine. And the, and the father of the bride says, you save the best wine to the last. That's what we're talking about. It's all, we're, we're running along the Jewish calendar. We'll talk about that next Sunday. But this wedding is so crucial. Beloved, Jesus is just waiting for something here. He's waiting for the father 
go get your bride. And soon we'll hear that trumpet blast, and the Lord will speak as a voice of the archangel, calling us all to come forth, and Jesus will fetch us. He will fetch us away and take us to the Father's house, where we will physically consummate our union with Him for seven years. In Revelation 3.10, Jesus told the church at Philadelphia, which describes the last Christ-exalting church, He said, because you have kept my command to persevere, I will also keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. While unbelievers are enduring seven years of tribulation down here, those who receive Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord will be enjoying seven years of tribulation over there with Christ in heaven. And beloved, the next event on God's prophetic calendar is the blast of the trumpet and the voice of the Lord to all who will believe. Let me ask you, if at that trumpet blast and that voice was uttered today, would you be dressed and ready to go? Let me just finish the calendar here and we'll go on. At the end of the great tribulation, Jesus will come return to this earth. We will come with Him. And we will reign with Him on this earth for a thousand years. That's all described in Revelation 19. After destroying all those who opposed Him with the sword of His mouth, He will establish His kingdom upon this earth, according to Matthew 19. And again, we will reign with Him for a thousand years. Many things are happening around the world right now that indicate we are near the start of the time of the tribulation. I don't doubt that. We'll cover those things perhaps in the coming sermons. But listen to me, as bad as it is right now, <laughs> In no way does it compare with what life will be like one second after the rapture. Can you imagine? Once the church is removed, all the restraint of evil is gone, and there will be an explosion of violence and, and evil, not just in the big cities, but in small towns and villages and hamlets. Vile and wicked behavior, almost like prior to the flood, will be unleashed upon this world, and it will be evil without restraint. No restrictions, no law. Even morally decent people who did not receive Jesus Christ as their Savior will have no place to hide, no place to run, and no one to call. Why? Because the whole world, the whole government will simply be totally corrupt. How far are we away from that? No place to go. So in closing, let me offer these four answers to the question back in 1 Peter, how should we then live? Number one, understand the Christian life is not a playground, it's a battleground. And we need to get serious about where we are on God's prophetic calendar and to set our affections upon things above and not upon what we've accumulated in this world or would like to accumulate. All these churches who are filled with smoke and mirrors and lights and whatever they call that smoke that rises out, that's a playground. And we've been on the playground too many years, it's time to get on the battleground. Second, we must open up our hearts and our minds to a new understanding of biblical prophecy. Every believer can understand what God says in His Word. Let me say that again because some of you don't believe that. Every believer aided by the Holy Spirit can understand the Scriptures just as well as I can. Third, just take things one day at a time. We need to know what God says about tomorrow, but we've got to live today. And regardless of how difficult it becomes, we are to be His witnesses in this world. Regardless of how difficult it becomes, regardless if they try to cancel us out or shut us up, we are still called to be His witnesses in this world. And finally this, if you've never received Christ as your Savior, beloved, now is the time to do it. I remember in the cotton patch years ago, I would love to get in the short rows because I could see the end from the beginning. We're in the short rows of the harvest right now, and I could see the end from the beginning. If you sense the Holy Spirit is stirring your heart to do that, obey that prompting today and do it soon. For I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I expect to hear that trumpet and that call any day now. Any day now. And I want to know for sure that everyone who is in the sound of my voice are ready to hear His voice. And they're dressed in His righteousness alone, faultless to stand before His throne. Let's pray together.
Oh, Father, please send your Holy Spirit now as you promised and speak through every heart here and every heart who's heard this word today. Lord, um, forgive us when we've taken so many things for granted. Forgive us when we've had a kind of a case the Ross the raw attitude. It's one thing to trust in the sovereignty of God, but it's another thing to say whatever will be, will be, which takes us all the responsibility off of us. But Father, if we have now heard the word, which we have, then we now ha we have a responsibility towards the word we've heard. And I pray that we will simply obey and do what the Holy Spirit prompts us to do. Lord, with all honesty this morning, we, we like a lot of, of our lives, and that's okay. But Lord, we need to live in the expectation of being snatched away at every moment. And I do pray, Father, that the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart would be acceptable in your sight if this was the moment you called us to come forth. Help us to understand that today. Help us to live in such a way that we wouldn't have to say, Pastor, you don't understand. The last word that my wife heard me call, I called her an evil, wicked name. And she went out in the glory thinking that's what I thought of her. Oh, beloved, think about it this morning. He has to live with that for the rest of his life. Oh, Father, forgive us. Forgive us, our Father. Prepare us to be received by you on that day which is soon to come. But we ask it in Jesus' name. All God's people said. Amen. Let's stand together, please. In my heart, Lord, be glorified. Hymn number 186. If you have a decision for Christ in this church, come make it public and come right now.